I, I, I think the thing, that, the thing that we're most proud, proud of is that we're able to participate through the years and meet great people and be involved with great people, you know. I remember I said to my father, Dad, there's no greater honor than, the, you, know, like, you know, like to have one's name associated with Torah. And we, you know, we were, we were very fortunate to be able to take advantage of the opportunity. And it was really, probably, you know, this is something that, that my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, my great-great-grandchildren will be, uh, you know, will also be recipients of. Jay, thanks so hello, much for coming hi. on. Hi, hello, how are you? You've been trying for three years to get me on, you finally got me. Finally got it, right? Yeah. In our private conversations, I've heard you talk a lot about your parents, and I want to know if you could tell our audience a little bit about your mom, your dad, and your upbringing. Well, you know, I was raised in a great home. My, uh, my parents, uh, they're always very charitable people. Uh, and, uh, you know, the door was always open for everybody. And, you know, they taught us very good lessons. You know, they, you know, they, you know, they, you know, they, you know, they taught us hospitality and they taught us like to help people. What was your first job? My first job or my first, uh, when you say job, you mean after I graduated college or before college? <laughs> well, let's go before college first. Yeah. You know, I've always enjoyed the business. You know, our family, uh, we, you know, the, we, we had department stores, furniture stores. And, uh, you know, I remember as a little kid, I used to go in, 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 into our showrooms and the furniture stores used to have a whisp room. Used, it used to whisk the uh, sofas, clean up the sofas. Uh, but then when I was uh, you know, 14, I started working in a department store. And I remember I started working in the stock room. In the lady stock room, I worked for my uh, Uncle Saul. Mm -hmm. and he had... Uh, and he'd pick me up and take me to work, and uh, you know he was, you know, he was a real stickler. He, uh, he expected you to work like everybody else, and you know, and act like everybody else. And, and he was a, you know, great example. And then my father, uh, uh, you know, always, you know, another great example, and and probably one of the, uh, you know, probably one of the great stories stories I remember when we were uh, uh, like. Uh, at 14 years old, I, I worked in the stock room, and then I got on the sales flo uh, floor. And I remember the uh, we used to have drawers. Every you, know, you give you you, get, you count your money out of a drawer. In the beginning, we'd run and ring the sales in everybody else's drawer. And my dad says, "Look, you got to have your own drawer." And I got my own drawer, and uh, and it was, you know, and it was a and then uh, and then one of the salespeople. Uh, and somehow he, uh, I was only 14. They wanted to see our, uh, you know, like our, you know, like, you know, you have, you have, you have to have a work, uh, like, a, you know, when you're under 16, you have to have like a work permit, mm. and even though it was our own store. So I had to go out, and uh, and they caused me a little problem. So I had to go out and get my own social security number, get, get permission written by the school to go to work. So I got all that, got it all done the same day, and I was back to work the next day. Mm. And, and it was, uh, you know, a very good example of, you know, of competition on the floor. And, uh, and look, you know, I've always enjoyed it. You know, I've always enjoyed between department stores, furniture stores, and uh, and you know, it was, it was great training grounds. Mm. And what were some of the core values in the business? Well, you know, the core values, core values. You know, we were raised where, 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 where when we were in business. It, you know, if there was a problem, it was what, you know, my father would say, what do we do wrong? Mm. Uh, you know, there was, there was no excuses. And, you know, and, and, and what you learn is you have to appreciate what the people do for you. And, uh, and that's very important. You know, uh, when my son Jonathan uh, uh, went to run a furniture store for the first time, I asked him, I said, what, what's your greatest challenge? And he said, the greatest challenge is to make people care. Mm. If people care, it makes all the difference in the business. It gives you the right environment. It gives you the right culture. And if they don't care, you're not going to have a business. Mm -hmm. Wow. And what are you most proud of between all the businesses and all the things that you've done? Well, I, I think that, you know, if I didn't give you this answer, you'd be uh, shocked. 
I, I think the thing, that, the thing that we're most proud, proud of is that we're able to participate through the years and meet great people and be involved with great people, you know, without a doubt, you know, the Sean Singamoras and Art Scroll is something that goes back to my father. We, in 1990, I remember uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was after services, we were in Kiddush, my dad said, I met these, I met Mayor, I met, met Rabbi Zolowitz, met Rabbi Sherman, and they asked me to dedicate a volume of, you know, the Talmud. It was early days. I said, Dad, it's fine with me. You know, you know, like Dad, like whatever you want to do, it's fine with me. And I said, you know, Dad, I said, you know, I use the, uh, you, know, uh, the you know, the art scroll uh, uh, moxers that makes my davening easier. And, you know, and they make great sitters. And maybe they'll send us some more books. A little I didn't know, we get, you know, you know, you know it, it, as time went on, we, as time went on, Time went on. We ended up with like a library of books, yeah. and um, and and really being involved with uh, with you know you know with with Mayor Zadowitz and with Nelson Sherman, and now with Gadaya uh, has been a highlight of our life. And then you know being involved in different projects like in Israel, we have met great people who've done great things, and you know been involved with Yeshiva University. So, you know, Dr. Norman Lamb was a great man, uh, and. Having the opportunity to meet the uh, you know really great people has been you know it's been a real like rewarding experience. Did you know the Schottenstein Talmud would be as well received as it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We knew that one day. Mm. You know, sometimes you do a project, you never see the uh, you see a little bit of the fruit, but you don't see a lot of the fruit. Here. This was something that was like instant, and you know, my father, my father only got to see just a couple of volumes published, but he was very proud of what he saw, and uh, and you know, and I remember when they, um, you know, like I, like I said, just said to you a minute ago, you know, my dad dedicated you know the, the first volume, Arabin. And then a couple weeks later, they came to my father and said, well, we have a second volume of Arabic. And, uh, and my dad said, okay. And he, and he paid for them both before the first volume was ever published. Mm. And unfortunately, after that, my father got, you know, got, got sick. And a few months later, uh, uh, Mayor and Nussin, uh, they like, came to my dad's house in, you know, in, in Columbus, my father, myself, and... And we, and, we, and we had a very close rabbi with us. Alan Senior was with mm -hmm. us. And he said, look, we've been approached about naming the whole Talmud. We feel comfortable with, you know, like, you know as far as your family's involvement, about doing it. And I remember I said to my father, Dad, there's no greater honor than, the, you, know, like, you know, like to have one's name associated with Torah. And we, you know, we, were, we were very fortunate to be able to take advantage of the opportunity. And it was really, probably, you know, this is something that, that my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, my great great grandchildren, will be, uh, you know, will also be recipients of. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And I remember a good friend of ours, uh, who was a member of the board of Yeshiva University, said to my dad, a jury, you know, jury, like, why'd you do it? And he said to me, that my dad's answer was, because one day my grandchildren will use it to, you know, to learn, mm -hmm. and, and they have. Yeah. Wow. Tremendous. And maybe talk a little bit about your personal relationship with Rabbi Mayor Zlotowitz. Well, Mayor was a, uh, uh, besides being a great scholar and a great uh, person, he was also a very close friend. There'd be times when Mayor would call me and he'd say, Jay, I just want to hear your voice. Mm. And I like hearing his voice too. And he was just, uh, always had a smile on his face. And... Um, you know, he was a perfectionist. Like when they would run these dinners, it had to be clockwork. Mm -hmm. There was a script, there was a time, everything had to just be right. And everything he did had to be perfect. Even the way, you know, Arts Girl, what they did was, they were the first to take Jewish books and make them beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at an Arts Girl uh, publication and you look at the quality of the way the book's made, it, it's a beautiful book just to start with. Right. You know, like the old ways, they used to just print and just put a cover on it. He changed that. He really changed the landscape of Jewish publication. 
Right. Tell us about that Matze Shabbos. I think it was in 2017, maybe in the summer or so, in the, yeah. the end of June. Right? Yeah, you know, uh, I remember a week before that, I was talking to my friend Saul Whitaker on the phone. He goes, you know, uh, the mayor's in the hospital. And I said, you know, I, I said, you know, he just had surgery not that long ago for his knee. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know what? No, no, he says very serious. So I remember uh, I had my good friend, Bob Book, and I said, Bob, and he, and he was at NYU Hospital, and Bob was very close to people at NYU. I said, will you call over to the doctor there to make sure that they give Mayor you know, extra good care? And Bob, called, Bob, and Bob called one of the heads, and one of the heads said to me, he said, look, I've known Mayor all my life. I knew his father real well. His father taught me. He says, don't worry, we're giving him the best care. And I remember a couple of days later, later, Bob went to visit Mayor in the room, got him on the phone. Jeannie and I were able to talk to him from Europe. And he sounded good. He sounded great. That Friday afternoon, he got uh, he got released from the hospital. He you know he went to home, uh, not not to his house. But he went to a place like to recover. He went to have Shabbos dinner, and later that night, it turned very you know everything turned. So that Sunday morning, uh, we got the call early, and then uh, you know it, you know it was on it was on a it was on a Rosh Chodesh. All right. Remember Zomrish Kodesh? So I said, Gedalia, should we come back to the States? He said, no, they're going to they're have the funeral like in Israel. So, it was, so we, ended up flying, we ended up flying right to Israel for the funeral. And it, it, it's only been a few times in my life where I cried, and that was one of them. Mm-hmm. And, and I always said this, and I'll say it again. There's nothing that my family could do to ever show much gratitude to... Uh, you know, to the Zalowitzes and to the Shermans for, 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 for what they did for us. I mean, they gave us an opportunity to do something that people knew the day everybody would have signed up for it. Mm. And, you know, being from the Midwest, you know, we're, you know, you know, we're more, uh, we, believe things, we, we believe things will happen quicker. And there was never no doubt in our mind about the completion of the, you know, of the art school of Talmud. My father was very comfortable. We were all very comfortable. And, and uh, there, there was never a doubt. Something that the Art School Gemaras did, in addition to opening up the Talmud to everyone, it also took the concept of Dafyomi. It skyrocketed. So many people joined the Dafyomi movement, which, of course, has the Siam Hashas something that you've been very involved with. Mm-hmm. Talk to us a little bit about the CMHS and maybe share with us what's it like saying Kaj in front of 100,000 plus people? It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a real experience. All of a sudden, when people say Amen, it's a big Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, look, it's, uh, you, know, you know, today's world, you, you, know, you, know, you know, recently, uh, you, know, you know, the Jewish world today, uh, uh, my family, uh, we were in Israel October 7th when everything uh, broke out. And, you know, we watch it very closely. Uh, uh, I, my son and grandson were just there a couple weeks ago. We're going to go in a couple weeks. It's the first thing, it's the first thing we look in the morning, the last thing we look before we go to bed, what's going on in Israel, and staying very close to what's going on. And, you know, we uh, had the opportunity to be involved with uh, Shai uh, Groucher sure. and, and with Gedalia, for the printing, right away, we print uh, 20,000 copies of a travel book of, of, uh, of the DAF that the soldiers could carry easy in, their, uh, easy in their pockets, be lightweight. And when you see the pictures in Gaza of the learning and the, and the, and, and the, uh, and the people in the tanks and the people in the infantry, and, and, and they even had this picture of the bulldozer, uh, you know, surrounding all the troops that are learning. Yeah. It just, it just talks to the greatness of our people. It really shows these young men who leave their homes, a lot of them have families. I mean, it's, it's heart-wrenching when you're seeing the, the amount of people dying, the amount of soldiers dying, seeing these are young families they're leaving behind. It, it just, uh, they, these are really, these are, these, these are real sadikim. Uh, I had a uh, colonel call me from the battlefield a couple weeks ago. They needed some uh, 
some, some books and needed some special things done. And he said to me, he said, in our units, we have 1,800 injuries. A thousand have already come back. He said, he said these thousand know what they're coming back to. Mm. It is like they're just coming in. They know what they're coming back mm. to, and they come back. Mm. And these are people who are fighting. They're fighting for every Jew in the world. Yeah. They're fighting not just for the land of Israel, for every Jew. And I think the reaction to the world, to, to, the, to the atrocities that took place on October 7th, I think is a shock and a wake-up call to every Jew in the world. And, and, and I think it you know, sends a message that no matter if you live in Israel, you live in Europe, you live in the United States, you live in Australia, every Jew is connected. Yeah. And, 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 and there's a connection there. It's a wake-up call. It's a real wake-up call, and I think it's an awakening. And I, you know, I don't know how God does his plans, but I, uh, there's a master plan out there, and when it's all done, we'll understand. Uh, but, but unfortunately, the sacrifices we pay are heavy, to, are really heavy sacrifices. Yeah. Now you see all these pictures of um, the Chayalim with, the, uh, with these Gemaras, and you see them dancing, and then you see these other videos of um, different singers traveling to Israel. It, 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 it's, it brings tears to my eyes when I think about the, you know, you know the love that's being shown, and the opportunity right now for every Jew to, have, to, do a, to do an act of kindness. It's really, it's an opportunity to be kind to each other and to really help each other. Yeah, you really have an opportunity because, you know, you always, uh, you know, growing up, you said, you know, if we were alive in the 30s, what would we have done differently? Well, we have a ch chance to do something. And to see how people, even if they have to just bake cookies, sell lemonade, everybody's doing something, little kids are doing things. And, and the love that's being showed, uh, my, uh, you know, like here in Miami, uh, there were a couple of my, uh, a couple of Rebbe's of my uh, grandchildren in, in the school. And one, and, 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 and one of them was a tankist, a tank commander. He came back, surprised everybody, and you see the video of him picking up his little children at the, uh, you know, at the preschool. And then he comes into the, uh, into the main the high school and they're having an assembly. The kids don't know he's coming. And all of a sudden he walks on the stage and instantly you see every, every kid charge the stage of the high school. They just charge him and just start hugging him. Wow. And when you see that, that expression, it's, it's really, uh, it comes from the heart. Yeah. And then you watch what's going on in Israel, how everyone's pulling together, and there's a lot of pain. I mean, this is real pain to the Jewish people. In my lifetime, I don't think we've ever experienced a war like this. Never, never experienced a time like this. But thank God we have a strong Israel. Uh, we have a strong sense of being, and we have people who really, uh, you, you just see how People got on airplanes to fly back to Israel. They didn't have to. And how people, you know, you know this summer there was a lot of, uh, you, know, you know, debating going on in Israel between the Supreme Court, what's going on. Yeah. People said they're not going to serve, they're not going to do this, they're not going to do that. Well, when the push came to shove, everybody yeah. rose. Those that even didn't have to even got up and got on planes. Yeah, they, checked, they checked everything and, at the door. And they wanted to go. Yeah. They didn't have to go, but they wanted to go. They wanted to go because they knew what they were fighting for. Yeah. Tremendous. Yeah. Unfortunately, we learned a hard way. Yeah. And then what's going on here locally? College campuses? Well, I think we have an opportunity today to really make sure that our children are taught, really taught about how Israel came about. It wasn't. Just one day someone woke up and said, well, we're going to have a colony there. To really understand the history, the history of the land, what we went through. We didn't take any land. Yeah. We, a lot of the land was paid for, bought for. Mm -hmm. the, Jew, the Jewish National Fund bought a lot of the land. And there were families sitting there developing. You know, Tel Aviv was not a city. Tel Aviv was a swamp that was converted into a city. 
uh, you know, you know, you know, the the land of Israel was a barren land. You you, uh, you read Mark Twain; he tells you it was like a desert; nothing was there. Yeah. And when the Jews came back, it made it green. The prophecy mm -hmm. came true. Right. Uh, and, and 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 it wasn't like it was sitting there like it is today. There was a lot of blood, sweat, tears that went into making that land, and a lot of sacrifices. Uh, you, you, you know the you know the land of Israel. We pray every day for. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem every day, not just for the last seventy-five years, for the last two thousand years. Yeah. Every day. Every day. It's, it's the dream of every Jew, the land of Israel. So this is this goes way back before there was ever a Muslim in the world. Mm-hmm. Way back. Yeah. Way before. So taking things maybe to a more local level in Columbus, Ohio. So just a few months ago, we had our uh, gala celebration and uh, it was a great event, um, uh, great speeches. Uh, the rabbi spoke beautifully, Gary spoke beautifully. And when you spoke, you said something that really stuck with me, um, very intrigued by. You said to the audience, what makes a city? What makes a city is full-time learning. So in the context of Columbus becoming a city with full-time learning, can you tell us the story about how that came about? Well, you know, you know it was after my father passed away. And uh, we had certain people in the community. I remember uh, we had a canter shift men who said to me, we should, we should try to have a call out. Rabbi Sasky, a blessed memory. He was always a very interested in starting a call out. We had Rabbi uh, Senior, yeah, and we said, "All right, let's go out." And, I, and, and, and the first meetings, uh, first meetings, uh, first meetings that were in my office, I remember we had, uh, uh, you know, uh, a little dinner. I think we had like uh, cold cuts for everybody. Yeah, and we talked about the concept of starting a call out, how we started, who we would go talk to first, and then as time went on, as we, as the search committee was, was uh, you know, was, was uh, you know, was figuring out where the call would come from. Uh, I remember talking to Rabbi Newberger, you know, of uh, blessed memory, Herman Newberger, who was a great man from, he came from near Israel. You knew sure. Rabbi Newberger. Yeah. He was a man that made things happen. He was, and he's a very close personal friend of my father and me. And I remember he said to me, he goes, Jay, if you take uh, Rabbi Morris, I guarantee you, you have a successful call out. This was uh, 30 something years ago, around 30 years ago. He said, I guarantee you, you have a successful call out. And he was an amazing man. Uh, he was very special. And what he said came true. And Rabbi Morris is still here. Yeah. And you're here. <laughs> and we've had a lot of great people come. And we have a lot of great people stay. And, and the call out has really has filled a lot of active roles in Columbus after these, you know, people, you know, are active in the Colel, served in the Colel. That, you know, they, they stayed in the community, become headmasters. Yeah. Uh, Shout out to Rabbi Drandoff. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Some became rabbis in the community. Uh, you know, you know, it just made a stronger community as far as the Yiddish guy. Yeah. And where do you see Columbus going? Well, we're a very fortunate town, Columbus. Uh, uh, you know, being a Midwestern town, uh, Columbus is on the verge of being probably to become maybe the fastest growing Midwestern town, even though we've been around a long time. Uh, we've had a lot of major investments come into Columbus, Intel, yeah. uh, and, and with, their, with Intel spending, what, what the companies around there are going to spend could be close to $100 billion. Yeah. It's going to bring a lot of people in, in, into the community. We have the largest, uh, we have the largest uh, university in the United States. We have the Ohio State University, which brings a lot of professional people in. Columbus, Columbus is going to be hot. It's yeah. going to be, it's going to just keep on growing. And what's good is we have a good basis in Columbus. Like you said, we have a strong cola, we have strong shoals in Columbus, uh, day schools, mikvahs. Yeah. Uh, so, so everything is, so all the, everything is there. And, and, uh, and to those that are listening, it's, it's a good opportunity and, and it's affordable. Yeah, it is definitely affordable. Yeah. Compared to the East Coast, it's a bargain. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, and, and the nice thing, I always looked at Columbus, that Columbus, was more like a suburb of New York City mm. as far as as far as the Yiddishkeit. 
Mm. We always had good Yiddishkeit, always had strong rabbis in Columbus. We have a great, you know, a great nucleus of people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A lot of great action, a lot of yeah. great energy, young yeah. blood. Um, something else that's been recent in Columbus that your family and Jeffrey have taken a big lead role in is um, bringing an awareness to emotional wellness. That's something that you guys have championed. Well, you know, unfortunately, it's not just Columbus. Yeah. It's, you can see what's going on in these universities today. Uh, I think Israel's going to need a lot of help, too. Yeah. I mean, when we get over this, I don't know uh, how much help is going to be needed in Israel for the... For the for the grieving and uh, and the and the everyone's affected there, and I think Jewish community right now everyone's affected. Sure. People don't sleep at night, and and uh, I just but in in all my life I've never seen a time like this. Now, when we started up at Ohio State was going to hopefully become a role model for universities. Sure. Around the country about how because we have an epidemic today between the. Uh, uh, between all the uh, between what goes on on campuses, the pressure these kids are under, and you see the you know the suicide rates, yeah, and and it's just really it, it it's really a challenge. And it's not just Columbus; it's all you know it's all over the country. And we took it on because nobody, you know, you know when you look at universities, if it's a heart institute, people put their name on the heart institute, medical centers, you put yeah. their name. Uh, you know, they put their name on for cancer, mm -hmm. but nobody puts their name on for, uh, for for these type of projects. And we thought it was very important. There's not a family in America not affected. Sure. And people don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to take the stigma away, the shame away. Because the people who suffer, they, 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 they have a sense of shame. And they shouldn't have a sense of shame. They can't help it. Mm hmm so the more we can make people aware of it and let people know that there, that there is help out there and they shouldn't have that stigma, maybe it takes a little pressure off and, and helps people get better quicker. Yeah. You know, Dr. Fon, who's going to be leading this initiative, uh, past guest of ours on this show, um, incredible person. We actually just heard him speak at the Turk Academy dinner. Um, incredible individual. He has his own story. Um, what, what are you looking forward to in his work, his research, and what Ohio State could be perhaps a role model for the world? Well, we'd we like to, you know, they're working on doing a, a program that, you know, that could be used by, you know, by the entire university and a model that could become the model to be used around the United States and, you know, in all the various universities. Yeah. I mean, you look what's going on since COVID. I think it's doubled. It, 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 it made people crazy. Yeah. Locking people up. Uh, look, nobody knew what the, what the, at that time, nobody knew what the protocols were. We just knew people were dying. Yeah. And, and the fright of getting this thing, people on ventilators. Yeah. It, it was frightening. Unfortunately, we had friends that passed away from it. Mm -hmm. And it was horrific. We had friends that were also on ventilators. The miraculously got off of the ventilators. It was, it was horrific times. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God we have vaccines today and we have ways of, uh, we have certain medicines we didn't have then. But, but it really, uh, you know, everything was shut down. We have what we had in one week. I had to close 1,800 stores. Wow. One week, 1,800 stores I had to shut down. That was a tough week. <sighs> and, and, and we didn't know when they're going to, we, we didn't know how long they'd be closed for. We thought maybe a week or two it turned out to be, you know, several weeks, and you just didn't know what to expect. And I remember, uh, you know, I was not, uh, you know, I was not a, a computer person or a virtual person. I had my grandchildren with me, uh, you know, they, they were part of our community where we separate ourselves from everybody, and they became my, uh, they became my uh, high tech crew. Yeah, and, and we were able to communicate, and all of a sudden. All of a sudden, we became good on the, between the WebEx, the Zoom, and the Teams, and we and we and I was really surprised how much you know how well we functioned that way, and really it changed everything. It changed America, it changed the way we do the way we do business, mm -hmm. changed the way people work, changed the way people stay at home, and but they're able to function. Yeah, 
And then during COVID, your dear friend Ellie Beer got very sick. Oh, it's a miracle. He, he, that, that, that man's a miracle, not just for recovering, but what he's done since. Some people, some people would have suffered like he did, would be scared to ever leave their home. Yeah. And, he, and he was out back traveling around, helping people. And, you know, that day, October 7th, because, because, because of we, what he set up, they literally maybe saved over 500 people that would have died. Wow. Literally. Because the, the system he set up, they had volunteers in every community. And those volunteers were already there, and they were able to go out and save people's lives. Mm-hmm. And respond. They were the first responders. And literally, uh, we just had a dinner for, for, uh, for Ellie. And he told the story. Literally, at least 500 people, they saved their lives. That, that would have, that, that, you know, they, they probably would have bled to death hmm. without the solid guys there and women and men there. And then you talk about the trauma they go through and Zaka and all these people. Yeah, they're going to need help. Yeah. He has people that what they saw we should never see. I don't want to describe it, but it's the worst of the worst. And you just don't get over, over that. Yeah. You see little kids and mothers and you know innocent people the way they were brutally butchered not uh, by wild monsters and beasts. Yeah. They're not human. Right, right. Where were you on October 7th? I was in Jerusalem, getting ready to have. Uh, we had a big, uh, we had we had a big Simchas Torah plan that morning. Yeah, yeah. I chomp brought all over the best chomp places, brought in from all over Israel. Yeah, remember a chomp taste off. Yeah, and we were all we were all ready, and all of a sudden uh, the sirens were going off. We were going to the bomb. We had to go to the bomb shelters. It was like something like in a movie. Uh, you were just going. You had forty five seconds to get to the shelter. And the way that our uh, the 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 uh, the way that our residence is is in Jerusalem, we have to go through it. We have to go through the next apartment to get to our to get to our shelter. And we go through the doors, and there's this family sitting there, all dressed up, and they're like looking at us. And we're coming through the you know ha, you know half slipper on, half slipper off. Yeah. And I said, follow me to the shelter, and um, and they end up do- and we we end up moving the services uh, into my. Uh, into my condo, and we ended up having services there, and we had the simple store there, and we and, and we had our group with us, and we are, we are bring the chant upstairs, mm-hmm. and so we ended up having that. But but every every few minutes, the the sirens were going off, we we're going back down, and and we didn't know what was going to happen because uh, we knew what was going on in the south, but it was very we were they, they were very concerned where, where they're going to have an uprising in, in like Jerusalem itself. Mm-hmm. And by that afternoon, there was silence in Jerusalem. The day before, I'd never seen Jerusalem this busy during Sukkot, the right, holidays. Right. It was, it was bustling. Yeah, it was bustling everywhere you went. I mean, the people everywhere. It was, it was great. So many people you couldn't move, but it was great. Then all of a sudden, there was nothing on the street. Total silence. And uh, and and I remember. There was a 24-7 market across the street, and one of our security people went over there, and they saw something. They had two people, two Palestinians working there, and they were laughing. So what are you looking at? And they were getting live stream of what was going on. They were live streaming it from Gaza to East Jerusalem and all over the West Bank. Mm. And everybody was watching the slaughter go on. Speechless. Yeah. And maybe as a, you know, I know we touched upon this earlier, but Biachan and Atzeach has really, um, with, amidst all the sadness, really showed uh, what Jews do for one another. Um, and I know how proud you are of Shai and his. And, uh, uh, Shai's, uh, Shai's done a great job. Uh, you, know, we, we, you know, we've got my friend and I, uh, uh, Bob Book. Uh, you know, privately for the last seven years, uh, we would send money, a certain amount of money to every terror, vi- every terror victim family. Mm-hmm. And but this was so many people, 
you just couldn't do it. So we started an organization called like Fallen Heroes. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are able so far raise several million dollars. And we have people like David Friedman, who's a co-chairman, the former so, ambassador. Yeah. Uh, we have a general, Israel Ziv, who was, you know, if you read about him, he's one of the generals that uh, his friends were in trouble and drove down and on the way, killed a lot of terrorists on the way. Uh, as one of the chairman people, we have Joe Lieberman, you know, former you know Senator Lieberman, one of the chairperson too. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got uh, the former uh, former Secretary of State. Uh, uh, we, we, we have Michael Pompeo, is also involved. Oh, yeah. Great guy. And uh, look, we got to try to do where we can to make it. You know, like like I said, there's a lot of young people. They're, you know, they leave a lot of pregnant you know, pregnant ladies, you know, uh, you know, widows. They got two, three kids at home, little kids at home. So we, whatever we could do to, to like help, you know, as far as better their lives, you know, whether it be financial assistance, as well as little things like Shy yesterday had a day for 18 uh, widows who were all expecting kids at home, a day where they went to the, they went to the Waldorf in Jerusalem they got manicures. They had psychologists there to talk to them. They had a, they, 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 they had masseuse there to try to make it a little easier for them. And, and they had a special luncheon where they were all together to try to help. So whatever we could do to try to make it a little easier on them, to try what comfort we could give them. Only God could give true comfort. Right. But whatever we could do to help make things a little easier... But we have people like Shy and the, and the people that work with Shy that have a big heart and they care. Yeah. And they try to make things a little better. And, you know, we have the things for the soldiers where we have barbecues mm -hmm. and uh, music. Entertainment, yeah. yeah entertainment, because we, we want to let them know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, uh, you, know, we, you know, we take things for granted. But in Israel... A lot of the soldiers, they don't know if, if they have support in America, not support. They don't know what the Jews of this country think. And when they know the Jews care about them from all over the world, they want to make sure that they, they have warm coats, mm -hmm. they have the right helmets. Laundry. Laundry, right helmets, which is very important. Sure. Medical supplies, clippers for cutting uh, wire clippers. Mm-hmm. Whatever little things, that, whatever things that you can help them with, and knowing it comes from abroad, it strengthens their resolve. Yeah, we're they know that, connected. that they're not by themselves. That yeah. they're the Jews around the world care, and they're representing us. I mean, I mean, what they're doing, and it, you know, it, it, you know, it, you know, it, it, it protects what we have here. And I don't know what the future will be in the future. Uh, hopefully. Hopefully, America it will be a wake-up call to, to Americans, to us, that what's being done and taught in these universities and some of these courses are being taught got to be stopped. Mm -hmm. And some of these professors, they have to be get they they really have to be thrown out. Yeah. You know, when you see the uh, the three most prestigious universities, presidents getting yeah. up in front of in front of Washington D.C. and can't even answer a simple question. Yeah. It's calling for genocide <laughs> against the Jews. It's about the context. And, and they say, they can't say yes or no. Yeah. And they say, uh, you know, it's on the, con in the contact. It's disgusting. Yeah. It's disgusting. If it was any other group. Oh, yeah. They burned the university down. Yeah. That's right. If they kept it, wouldn't it be around? Yeah. Something that went viral uh, maybe a week or two ago was this very emotional and special birthday party for this seven-year-old girl. Tell us, how did you get connected with her? Well, well, Shai, like we said, Shai's a very special person. So Shai gets a lot of calls uh, uh, you know, over Israel. He's becoming well-known. And someone called, he went over there, and he met the, you know, the seven-year-old and the three-year-old sister. This, the, this was a family that lived down in the south. They always had a backpack ready to go. They got in their car, started driving. All of a sudden, they were shot at. The father took one of the daughters, ran one way. The mother took the other daughter, ran the other way. They killed the father. The little girl snuck back in the car. The mother was killed with a policeman. And somehow the little girl snuck back. And the older sister 
took the sheet and covered her. They covered each other, and they went looking for them. They couldn't find them. They went like five times in the car looking for them, and they were just quiet, buried under the sheet. It's amazing wow. that they had the presence to stay quiet during this time. Wow. And, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they stayed there for several hours until they were rescued. Hmm. And they heard Arabic the whole time. But five times they went in the car looking for these little girls. Couldn't find them. Wow. Yeah. And, and, then, uh, and then my son and my grandson were at the birthday party. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and another gentleman was with him who were very close to us, who was a former Israeli uh, soldier and a tough guy. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, on the trip, I, and I said, what was the hardest part? Making the Shiva calls, what was? He said, that birthday party was the hardest thing. Because he, he said, when I watched that seven-year-old girl, it was her birthday, but how she made sure her little three-year-old sister had presents too. Wow. And how she, every, everything she did, she kept watching her little sister. Unreal. He said, he said, that tore him up, because he has little kids at home. He said, that one thing tore him up. That tore him up more than anything. Wow. <laughs> this only happens in our people. You know? Yeah. I think one of the things that, um, at least for myself personally, you know, we're always taught you know, we're the chosen people. Um, and we know that and we say that, but, you know, when you see so many people that want to get rid of us, I, I think you're seeing the insides of a person, their neshama is like roaring. You know, in D.C., hundreds of thousands of people coming and, uh, you know, Jews of all, all types, all stripes, really coming together. You know, we're a special people. Yeah, we, we just have to make sure that after this... Stays that way. Stays that way. And, and look, in this group here, the here, here, it's a more observant group that we're talking to on these videos, I assume. Well, we have a pretty broad audience. Uh, pretty broad audience. But at the same time, we have to be a good examples. Right. Everyone has to do the right thing. They can't worry about what the other person does. Always, I, I remember one time I asked someone who was a very fine man, I said, what do you think about all this, all this going around the world? There's always something going on. He said, you can't worry about it. He said, you got to do the right thing. You do the right thing, everything else will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. So you got to do the right thing, and you can't worry about what the other person does, but you got to do the right thing, period. Mm -hmm. And maybe as a concluding question, on a, perhaps on a lighter note, something that we're seeing um, around the world, but specifically in Columbus, is the rising of young leadership, uh, young people getting involved, joining different boards, uh, you know, spearheading different campaigns, um, you know, in Eastmore, uh, Bexley, and Berwick, and I told you about Triple Whale last time we spoke. Um, what's your message to the next generation of leaders that are really, that are really, already are leaders? Well, my message is very simple. At one time, I remember being the youngest, and time goes so fast that, that, you know, as time goes, you're not the youngest anymore. <laughs> but, the, but the opportunity is there to make things happen. And it's amazing looking back about what you could accomplish at a young age. It's mm -hmm. really amazing. When we look at a lot of successful people, what they've done at their, when they were young, it's, it's amazing. You know, age is a number. But, you know, like you say, sometimes say, you got to show up. Yeah. And you're never too young to show up. Look, I would just tell you this. With what's going on in the world today, we have to speak out and speak up while we can. Mm -hmm. If you don't speak up and you don't, and you don't shout, who else is going to do it for us? That's right. And you got to tell yeah. the story. you got to learn the story. you got to be able to tell the story and share the story. Well, so this interview was in the making for a couple of years. I'm so happy that we got to do this. Um, really couldn't have been a more timely um, time to do it. Um, you know, from my standpoint, uh, to sit down with someone who, you know, objectively, perhaps one of the greatest um, Torah philanthropists in the history of our world, 
and the Jewish people is an honor for us. So on behalf of the Kolot podcast, uh, Rabbi Morris, um, our Kolel, our great Kolo rabbis, our alumni, the entire community, thank you for what you've done for our city, for our community, and really what you, Jeannie, and your entire family have done all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. To listen to all Kolot episodes and see upcoming guests, visit kolopodcast.com. We are also on all podcast players. Type in Kolot on iTunes, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Podbean, and Amazon. Share with your friends and please make sure to give us a five-star review. Kolot is a project of the Columbus Community Kolel, a full-time Jewish learning center in Bexley, staffed with high-caliber Torah scholars. Ever since 1995, boys, girls, men and women from all backgrounds and affiliations have found many opportunities to connect with Torah and mitzvot at the Kolel. Whether it's a study partner, an engaging lesson, or a program, the Kolel is your one-stop shop for all your Jewish learning. If you want to know how you can benefit from the Kolel, visit thekolel.org. That is T-H-E-K-O-L-L-E-L dot org and forever be inspired.